Thank you. Well, good evening again, friends. It's so nice to see you all and to be with you all. About the only good thing I can see about COVID times is that distance is no obstacle. <laughs> During the 32 years I taught at CFS, I sometimes used guided meditations to introduce a writing prompt, to settle in an antsy classroom, or to help students learn to make the most of settling in or silent meeting. This evening, we're meeting during especially challenging times. We are separated in space, even as we strive to be present together. As a nation and a school, as families and individuals, threats seem to abound from the pandemic to environmental catastrophes, to poor political leadership or the lack of it, to a rising tide of hate that makes racism more visible than ever in America. So many of us are anxious and angry and struggling to find or regain a true center. On top of that, many of our most dependable sources of comfort may not be available to us. We are locked down, separated from friends and family, and unable to connect with communities and places that give us strength. CFS is one such community and place. School is in session now, but still closed for most of its students. Teachers are stuck at home, just as students are. Interactions have become two-dimensional and touchless. It's hard to sync up a conversation these days. In such times, our sense of nostalgia and our need to be grounded may be heightened. That's the case for me. Tonight, I hope to address this upsetting sense of unsettledness by helping you reconnect to a place you knew and that knows you. CFS was, is, and with continued recommitment will remain a special place. For some of us, it may even be sacred ground. My goal here is to enrich and uplift the CFS person who is you by deepening your sense of the process you and the school have co-created. I invite you to begin the meditation by thinking of a very particular moment in your CFS experience. Choose a place and time that calls up a fond memory for you. It might be what you noticed when you first walked onto the campus or into your teaching space. It could be a place inside or outside that held special meaning for you. Close your eyes if you wish. Turn off your picture if that makes you feel more comfortable. And let's all settle in with a few slow and deep breaths. You don't have to be seen right now. You only have to listen. In your memory and imagination, notice where you are at CFS. What do you see? Use your sense of smell. Dwell for a moment in the particular place that comes to mind when you think of yourself as a friend's school person. In a moment, I will take you from where you find yourself 
back, way back, and then forward in time. It will take less than 30 minutes and end in silence, which Rebecca Swartz will break. Imagine a time long, long ago, a distant, misty time, literally as old as dirt. Bob Druin told me that the rocks on campus date from approximately 500 to 600 million years ago. What is today Piedmont, North Carolina was then volcanic island terrain on the margin of the ocean and the North American protocontinent. Think of a ring of fireplace like Indonesia, Hawaii, or Japan. That's the starting point for CFS land. The red clay we ramble on today is the weathering product of formerly molten material. After several continental collisions with a landmass that's now Africa, the Appalachian mountain chain was formed 200 or 300 million years ago. Waterways like the Noose River Basin were paths of least resistance for water traveling from the mountains to the sea. Durham spreads out today over a river basin created during the Triassic period, about 220 million years ago. At that time, Mount Sinai was a river bank. CFS land was underwater. Successive ice ages caused the river water to change state and to sleep for long, silent periods of time. Finally, about 10 to 12,000 years ago, the last glaciers receded. The Eno River, New Hope Creek, and probably the CFS Creek came to life at that time. Gurgling waters drifted and occasionally rushed eastward. As the land warmed, people, came to inhabit the new terrain. Some probably arrived from the Southwest. The first Americans crossed over the land bridge that linked the Asian and American continents. Maybe some ancestors of Native American people also crossed the Pacific Ocean in boats. Recent archeological evidence suggests that some ancient peoples may have come to the Americas from the Northeast along the edges of great shelves of ice that joined what are today the European and American continents. However they got here, North Carolina's first people were well established 8,000 years ago, thanks to the species that sustained them. Norm Budnitz suggested that the climax forest, which stood majestically all around us, would have been comprised of oaks, hickories, and maybe chestnuts, with some red maples and beeches in the wetter places. This temperate woodland ecosystem supported a wide variety of creatures. Michael Bonsignor noted that the first people of this land hunted animals, large and small. They also gathered the abundant nuts, ate the leaves and fruit, and used the fiber of many different plants. The first Americans intimately knew the ways of plants and animals, for their lives depended on that knowledge. Henry Walker observed that by 500 years after what's called the Christian era, the population of North America had exploded. Within an easy walk of an hour or of several days at most from the current CFS main campus, North Carolina's first peoples built sustainable towns and substantial mounds 
all across the landscape. Agriculture combined with older hunting and gathering techniques to feed the expanding human population. Permanent settlements arose where water was abundant, as was, was the case with Okanichi Village, what is now Hillsboro. Spear and arrow points found in the CFS Creek and flint napped flakes discovered above it by Doug Myron suggest that at least temporary settlement took place along the CFS Creek. South facing hillsides near water sources, even intermittent ones, were preferred locations. Settlers from modern Europe established the first North American colonies about 400 years ago. During the following century or two, an invasion of settlers came. Many were indentured servants. Others, mostly enslaved people, began to arrive from Africa or as the descendants of African peoples. The presence of the newcomers introduced new and deadly diseases to native populations, which were apparently already in decline due to drought or other causes. Superior technology, the force of arms, the power of capital, and growing numbers of mainly English and Irish immigrants led to the ascendancy of European American culture on land where the school stands today. Native Americans and African Americans became outcast allies, equally inferior in the eyes of most of the pale-skinned conquerors. However, many of North Carolina's early Quaker settlers, whom George Fox visited in the autumn of 1672, probably regarded themselves as more Native American than European in their outlook. The Okanichi people, who originally came down from Tidewater, Virginia, pushed south by a snowballing mass of European settlers, briefly were a local power, but by the time the war with Britain divided the sympathies of the new Americans, members of that Okanichi tribe had been scattered and absorbed, either as economically disadvantaged blacks or as more socially mobile whites. I like to imagine the woods on the CFS campus serving from time to time as a place of refuge for people seeking simply to be left alone. A colonial road, originally a Native American trading path, briefly followed the creek that most clearly defines the land that is now CFS. End to end, that colonial road stretched from Hillsboro to Newburn. 27-year-old John Lawson, walked on or very near this road as he traveled through the Carolinas in 1701. Lawson later wrote favorably about the land, animals, and people he encountered in a book entitled A New Voyage to the Carolinas. This volume, published in London in 1709, was partly responsible for an influx of new settlers to central North Carolina, quite a few of whom, for a time, were Quakers. Martha Klopfer once showed me where the high-banked Eno Lawson Road crosses the CFS Nature Trail, behind their house near the gravel horse training ring. From Mount Sinai Road, close to Old Stony Way where the walkers live, the colonial roadbed enters the CFS campus near the shop, follows the creek, and continues through campus to traverse what is now my son Dave's farm. Red's Quality Acre on Norm Budnitz's land. Quakers, mainly from Ireland, settled along the Eno River in the 1750s and built simple but successful mills, taverns, and farms, and more than one meeting house north and east of Hillsboro. In fairly short order, more ruthlessly enterprising colonists forced these early friends off their prime land. As the regulators heralded the dawn of the American Revolution, a mass migration of 40 Quaker families to Georgia signaled a friendly retreat 
from Orange County conflicts in 1768. During the 19th century, the CFS campus became part of, or at least the neighbor of, the Couch Plantation. Friend School Road used to be called Couch Road until it was relocated to higher ground in the 1970s and then renamed by Orange County in the 1980s. Cotton and tobacco were probably raised on the clear cut land that became CFS. Certainly hay, corn, and field peas were grown here in the decades before the first students arrived. Back in 1865, with General Sherman's Union Army occupying Raleigh and Johnston's Confederate forces massed in Hillsboro, CFS was a no man's land. Foraging or patrolling soldiers must have roamed the campus that early spring. A cannonball and a musket ball were found in the creek many years ago, and canister shot was discovered on the side of the lower school. Tom Magnuson, a local historian and parent of two CFS graduates, speculates that artillery pieces might have been fired in the direction of the creek bottomland as batteries discharged their loaded rounds at war's end. More Civil War relics, or artifacts from even earlier times, can probably be unearthed if we carefully dig the footings of future buildings. After the Jubilee of Emancipation, the old Couch Plantation became a racially diverse neighborhood of subsistence farmers, dedicating the high ground to the glory of God Former slaves founded the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church in 1871. Both black and white couches lived close by what is now the school, and some remain its neighbors. Quite a few descendants of the black couches became valued members of the CFS community. An American Friends Service Committee work camp in the late 1960s did much to forge friendly relationships between the new school and the older church. As the 19th century yielded to the 20th, sharecropping residents of the Mount Sinai community would cut through land that's now the CFS campus as they walked to Hillsboro or to University Station. The train was a main artery of transportation to Durham in the first half of the 20th century, although farm and household supplies were typically hauled to and from Durham with a wagon and a mule. In the early 1970s, Greg Garneau and Carol Stern learned much about these old time ways when they worked and visited almost daily with Tom and Bessie Couch, then elders in the Mount Sinai community. Yeah. Two decades later, Jamie Hichelin and Bryce Little learned their own lessons in local history when they and their upper school students interviewed older neighbors about the lively juke joints and the Piedmont blues scene that flourished from the 1930s into the 1950s, not only in Durham, but also right along Mount Sinai Road. A video documentary made by Kenny Dalsheimer highlights those times. Bootlegging was a thriving trade back then. The location of a still, once operated by a Mr. Lee in the 1940s, can still be seen from the CFS Nature Trail. On Valentine's Day, 1959, Peter and Martha Klopfer, a new Duke faculty family, purchased the land that is now CFS. It had served as a simple country retreat for a Durham man, Mr. Hall, who liked to fish. In 1933, a previous owner, Mr. Buchanan, pronounced Buchanan by the locals, built the dam that formed the pond near Lower School and just inside the original entrance to CFS. The house where the Klopfers still live was constructed in the 1940s. Peter Klopfer told me that the farmland was not well tended when his family moved in here. It had gone into succession and was badly overgrown. The pastures had probably not been mowed for several years. With sustained care and effort, the Klopfers improved and expanded the farm, raised three daughters there, 
and manage generations of horses, goats, sheep, poultry, elk hounds, and other members of the animal kingdom at Tierreich Farm. Through the decades, the school grew up alongside the Klopfer family. Gretchen Klopfer Wing remembers CFS as being like a third sister to her. From the beginning of their time in Durham, the Klopfers were deeply engaged, along with other members of the Durham and Chapel Hill meetings, in ending racial segregation. Carolina Friends School came to be as members of the meetings were led to demonstrate against segregation by creating a school that welcomed all students and was founded on Quaker principles. CFS was incorporated in 1962, perhaps the first elementary school in the modern South to be dedicated to racially integrated education. The school's first employee was hired in 1963 with funds originally allocated for conducting a feasibility study to determine if it made sense to start a school at all. The Durham Kindergarten, later known as Durham Early School, opened its doors to students in September 1964. And on September 13, 1965, the Chapel Hill Early School became the second unit of Carolina Friends School. The main campus opened the following year. Its first building was the central portion of today's lower school. The multi and the current river class were added later. However, the first structure built on CFS land was the water tower. David and Susan Smith of Durham Friends Meeting envisioned a great people to be gathered here, as George Fox might have said. They wanted to ensure a plentiful supply of water for the community to come. By 1970, CFS enrolled 250 students. Four prefab World War II era buildings, the UK's originally erected on the UNC campus, housed the middle school until a new middle school building opened in 1971. The current Music House and Annex are former UKs. In 1972, the Quaker Dome was constructed. The school's longest serving staff members were hired in the very early 1970s. CFS honored its first graduates in 1973. A young man, Willis Bunk James, and a young woman, Tyree Barnes. These two African-American teenagers had left their segregated schools in Eastern North Carolina as a matter of principle. The next year, 10 CFS students graduated from what is now called the Early College Program at Guilford College. In 1975, the original Log Upper School building opened its doors. Teacher and Durham Meeting Elder Cal Geiger supervised this building project along with his young teaching assistant, Terry Pendergrass. By this time, and with only two early schools, CFS had grown to accommodate 425 students. Current enrollment is 514. During the 1980s, further improvements were made to the main campus. This center building was constructed by contractor and former school parent Bob Calhoun and completed in 1986. The campus early school, originally a house purchased with donated funds and moved from a location halfway down Mount Sinai Hill, opened in 1988, and the shop was completed in 1991. A predecessor to all these projects, the upper school hut, was built under the guidance of Terry Pendergrast and John McGovern with help from students. Wood for constructing the hut, originally called the Student Lounge, was cut with a portable sawmill powered by a VW engine. It's interesting to note in this connection that in the 1920s and 30s, the father of Tom Couch had made a hard but profitable living operating a sawmill that furnished ties for the Southern Railroad. In the 1990s, lower school, middle school, and the early schools were all expanded and updated, 
Ellen Weinstein and Dale Dixon worked with staff and board to design these campus improvements. Following the school's first capital campaign with a million dollar goal, a library, art studios, science labs, a computer lab, and several new classrooms added two new buildings for upper school and middle school use in 1993. The CFS gym and its adjacent soccer fields went into service in the year 2000, the generous gift of an anonymous donor. The gym and soccer fields occupy land once owned by sisters who disliked the school, perhaps because it was integrated, but definitely because they thought that noisy students and traffic disturbed their rural peace and quiet. These couch sisters, who had married Widener brothers, would never have sold their land to the school, but through a cleverly conceived arrangement, they sold their land to Duke Forest, who then swapped some wetland behind the campus early school for the site that now accommodates the gym and playing fields and the current school entrance. Today, that entrance leads to paved roads and accessible paths and buildings. In the 1970s and 80s, CFS teachers used to joke that the school was ungraded, like our driveway. The next campus improvement was the upper school meeting hall in 2009. Inspired by audacious aspirations, CFS launched the Building Friends campaign from 2010 to 2015. This unprecedented fundraising initiative transformed, expanded, and modernized the entire school. The 2013 opening of the renovated Quaker Dome launched a wave of improvements that touched every unit and put foundations beneath the school's biggest teaching and learning dreams. The middle school renovation and expansion took place in 2014. Lower schools followed in 2016. New water and road infrastructure was added to extend the main campus across the creek, first with a baseball field and then in 2018 with the opening of the pack. This new performing arts center, a 12,800 square foot space is the largest building on campus. Featuring a 350 seat theater and state of the art technology, the pack supports and amplifies the performing arts curriculum that has long been the heartbeat of CFS. This is where the school stands today, on its beautifully rural main campus home, with two early schools located at the Friends meeting that conceived it, with a steadily growing number of students, staff, parents, and alumni, and with a vision that has never been articulated with more boldness, clarity, and specificity. Thanks to the commitment of many talented, industrious, principled, and generous people, CFS has grown into a mature institution, one with an inspiring past and a future that promises further challenges and still greater achievements. May we continue to be responsible guardians of the philosophy and purpose we are heirs to and grateful custodians of the land that grounds everything we do as teachers, learners, parents, and trustees of the spirit of this sacred storied place.
I'm going to take a second to turn up my lights. Everybody kind of come out of settling out. I'm grateful to Rebecca for giving me the chance to uh, revise and update this piece. And I'm especially grateful to the CFS teachers, past and present, whose names I mentioned for pertinent information they shared with me in the last decade. Please accept my apology, though, for largely omitting other names from this bird's eye history. So many people have done so much for CFS that I hesitate to single out certain ones as history makers, lest I slight anyone's contribution. It's the people who built this school community and are most central to its becoming. And with each passing day, it's other people who help create today's history that tomorrow will be looked back at. And so everybody in this room plays a role in that. I can look around at all y'all's names and whether I know you or not, I know your names. And I'm grateful that you were here. Um, I think about following Jim's talk, I think about the turkey trot which I know is not something you can be at if you're in California or Norway or another part of the country. Um, but on the turkey trot, if you ever find yourself in Durham on Thanksgiving morning, that is not a COVID-19 year, okay? Hopefully after this year. Um, Martha Klotford leads a walk that takes you directly across the road that Jim referenced, that seems to be a trail that comes from the shop up through the land. And that feeling of being in history when you're on campus, it's pretty hard to beat. Um, I also just want to say there's a lot of opportunity in what Jim talked about. There's a lot of all of us sharing our memories that feed into the land and the place and the history that Jim described. And I hope we'll keep adding to that. And I hope that you know your voice is wanted and desired, greatly desired in adding to those stories. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. So if you don't feel like you're accessing those right now, please, please, please find me. I'm, the, I think, the only Rebecca at CFS, and I want to hear from you. Um, lastly, I want to say, Jim talked about building friends and all the changes that have happened since then, which have been in pretty much the last decade. But the non-renovated Quaker Dome holds a really big place in my heart, as does the, uh, the water tower that many of us remember in the center of campus. And um, I, I just don't want to let it go without saying that those things are really special too. And I hear stories from alums of playing basketball in the snow in the Quaker Dome or various things that happened over the years with the water tower that we don't need to talk about right now. Um, <laughs> but I know it's a lot of people's, a part of people's mythology. And for those of you that don't know about it, who want to know about it, I am more than happy to gossip with you at any other time during the day. So just let me know, okay? And I'm gonna turn it over with a big fat thank you to Jim. It's been a long time since I've heard that, and I'm really, really grateful. Thank you, Jim. Well, thanks for the opportunity to share this perspective, and I, I hope it was enriching uh, for you in these challenging times. It's really great to be together. If I'd never have to hear about these times challenging again and only have to think about the ways that I've connected like this that are different, I'll be grateful. <laughs> Jim, I'm so glad I made that catastrophic mistake by hiring you years ago. <laughs> Thank Me you, too. Jim. It was wonderful. <laughs> so 
folks, if you would like to stay, I'm going to leave the room open for at least the next 15 minutes, whether I'm in the room or not. You are welcome to chat or catch up or leave a note in the chat if you want me to email you or connect you in any way that you're not currently feeling connected, okay? <laughs> Some people came a little later and didn't have the chance perhaps to introduce themselves at the beginning. If anybody would like to say hello in that way, uh, please, please. So sorry for that because I feel like I know everyone and I just totally skipped over it after saying I would invite that in the beginning. So thank you, Jim. <laughs> so this, this is, is the ring wall. This is Jan Z. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. This is the ring waltz, Sharon and Chris. Chris's mother, uh, Mildred, was one of the founders from the Chapel Hill meeting. Um, our son, Stuart, uh, attended CFS uh, from age three through high school. So he hit every grade, uh, um, every level, um, and <coughs> was so clearly shaped um, by the school. It was like a third parent uh, mm -hmm. for us. And he's a teacher in the Alamance Burlington schools. Uh, for the second time this year, he won teacher of the year for mm -hmm. his school, was a finalist for the countywide um, teacher of the year. And the credit goes to Henry and Bryce and so many, and Pat Dalton and so many other people. This was not our doing. It was the schools. We're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jim, it's lovely to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you, Chris and Karen. <laughs> This is Jan Zink. Forgive me, I keep trying to, to get in to apologize that I can't put my camera on. I, it's been not working all day, but uh, it was a beautiful thing to listen to. And I, I thank every person, every face and voice that's here has enriched the story as well. Thank you so much. Jim, it was wonderful. Thank you, Jan. Thanks, Jim. It was awesome. I'm sorry I missed it half of it, but I enjoyed the half that I got. This is Jillian. So glad you could join, Jillian. Nice to see you. You're in my virtual fitness studio, so I had a class right before yours, so I couldn't be before your so I couldn't jump in on time. Well, great. Thanks for fitting us in. No, no, no. I would have rather, <laughs> I don't know. Jim, I would have rather been with you all, seriously. <laughs> Anyhow, it was wonderful. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Dylan, there may be other opportunities, so I'll make sure to include you if I can, okay? In case you want to catch the first half. Hey, Don. Hey, the rest of you. You know, I'm looking at Mark Goodwillie and thinking about Henry Walker's and Mark's collaboration with all these great videos on Henry's unofficial history of CFS. Uh, Does anyone not uh, know about that in this small group now? So there's the unofficial history. We usually list it in e-news. If you're not getting e-news about once a month, maybe every two months in long periods like the summer, please let me know. Um, we also have Quaker Dome, which is an alumni site on Facebook. But if you are an alum at any point, whether you graduated or not, you're an alum. If you are a former staff, in any way. You're a alumni staff. If we can count you an alum in any way, we want you on Quakerdom. 
<laughs> so please let me know because that's a great way for me to make sure that you're getting our communications if you're not already getting e-news it's just another double check and it's a way for you to share with your network of which not everyone wants to be on Quaker Dome or there's a 1970s alumni group which is sort of broad but it's mostly lifers from the early years um, I want to make sure that you're hearing from us and I want to know that if you're not, how can we connect you? Because nobody should feel excluded in any way. And that's not the intent by any of these sites or any on the various channels. It's just trying to meet people where they are. And thank you. Hey, Jimbo, thank you. It was absolutely wonderful. Good yes. night. Thanks for making time to be part of the evening. It was great. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Okay. Thank you, friend. Hi, Don and Mark. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, dears. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Nice to see you. Yeah. Great to see you again before long. <laughs> Glad to have Myra with us, too. You betcha. Yeah. Good night, all. Night. Good night. Just go leave, 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 leave. Hard, hard to say goodbye. Bye, Mark. Bye, guys. <laughs> Mark, you can hang on as long as you want. Marissa. Yes. Rule your maiden name, your original name? Uh, Marisa Soldi. Oh, yeah, for Pete's sake. Oh, my. It's <laughs> like, I know who you are. Holy cow. You look Yeah, great. Krista and my younger sister's Christiana, Krista Soldi. Right, right. The, the, the two girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then my mom and dad. My mom was on the board with Peter Klopfer for many years and did the Carolina Friends School um, craft fair that she did with uh, Susan Lindsay's mom. Um, for several years and yeah I, I it's nice to see you guys I, I knew you looked familiar but I, the sprule threw me off so I yeah I it's um too, so I can't I didn't want to leave you right. it's hard to remember when you see a face and you're oh I know that face but that name doesn't fit <laughs> well I, I have a terrible time remembering names ever yes just, and it's a lot easier for students because there was one of you but there were m millions of us <laughs> I, I was teaching uh chemistry one day and this the door opens and in comes this young lady who was had been had graduated the year before and she was talking about how she was loving chemistry in college and, da -da 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 -da, and she walked out the door and i turned to the class and said who was that <laughs> <laughs> this, i mean she looked for me, and, and so this one young lady says Oh, how can you? You mean next year you won't remember me? And I said, oh, <laughs> I'll never forget you. That's right. You caused me so much trouble. Exactly. I remember science class with you and the cathode ray tube explanation and the uh, bread pudding explanation for the atoms. And <laughs> hey, there you go. Oh, my goodness. So many memories of all of our classes with all the teachers. It was just... A magical world. <laughs> it, it was. It, it's, um, I, I thought about sharing. I went to Wilmington Friends School for high school, for seventh through 12th grade. Oh, wow. It was founded in 1748. You talk wow. about tradition. You, you couldn't get, that school, I, looking, it, it was morally bankrupt. It, wow. All the literature said the right stuff because it was a Quaker school, right? But right. Quaker about the school. It was just a prep school. Oh, interesting. Oh, it was. I, it was horrible. I had a terrible experience there. Wow. And and my high school chemistry teacher was the became the headmaster at Carolina Friends School, and that's how I got to to, to be hired. <laughs> oh wow! A really strange coincidence. Set of coincidences. And but, so, like, specific to Carolina Friends School in those yes, early days. And, and so, you know, I have this uh, memory of this, of this hidebound prep school, all white. And then you have this school, in the hippie school in the woods, you know. And, it, <laughs> and, of course, when I got there, I was sort of out of step because I was pretty, uh, 
how shall I say this? Bonnie, you can help me out with this. <laughs> I was a race car driver. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I'll have you know, I just completed a 24 hour race this past weekend with three, wow. other, three other drivers and who had the fastest time in the daytime and the nighttime. You wore that hot uh, <laughs> uniform in the Halloween parade. And that sounds so unsafe. <laughs> I'm just going to say, as current staff, I'm not allowed to say that's okay. <laughs> it's safer than you driving on the highway. So, Mark, are you saying we mellowed you? Yes, you did. The whole process <laughs> did. And it's really, um, I, I, I mean, I, the best example is my daughter went there for the 15 years. She never really got friend school, right? She just never really got it. Well, she became a teacher in Arizona, and I went and visited her one time. And so I'm sitting there for three days, I guess it was. And it's like all these things she was doing came from friend school, but she uh. didn't know. It was. <laughs> and, you know, I, I said, well, you know, where do you think you, you know, she was great. She really was great. How do you think you knew how to do that? And she, mm -hmm. and then it just sort of dawned on her over the couple of years that, that she really had um, learned a lot and had had turned her into a really cool person so that's just the kind of thing I mean look at look at all you guys you you turned out to be very special people not just because of your genetics but you know because you caring parents who thought that this school offered a value and it was a sacrifice I mean it, it cost money real money I'm adopted uh, I have a very I had a very rigid German mother who lived through ah. World War II in Germany. Oh, My wow. dad's still alive, but he came from pretty extreme poverty. Um, uh -huh. And from upstate New York poverty, which innately was pretty dang racist. We oh, had yeah. those little oh. yard jockeys. Ah. In our front yard when we moved from Indiana, which was 1983, to Asheville. Huh. And they left it behind. Well, that was good. And they said, well, I don't think we should bring that to the South. But nobody said to me, that would be completely inappropriate because it's bullshit and you shouldn't do that. <laughs> right. You know, it's racist. I, I grew up with all the stereotypes and not towards just one race, but all races, right. you know, right. whether it was a right. Polish joke or a blonde joke or right. a, How about Italian someone's skin tone. It was a joke. We had spicks, Italians, you know, we had all that. Absolutely. And uh, beaners and, you know, it, it, it was just. No. There were no beaners in Wilmington, Delaware. No beaners then. <laughs> so my dad was in the army. He got positioned in Georgia from upstate New York. He'd never been anywhere other than that. And he got hit on, not just by a guy, but by a black guy. Oh my. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> and my dad is one of the most sweet, kind, genuine, and generous humans I know. Right. But he'll call someone while being generous things that I don't think are okay, or he'll make jokes. Yeah. But, they're not but, okay, but he doesn't mean them because he's raised that way. He doesn't really understand. He's 85 in October. Listen, I'm 72. Wow. You know? um, well, we all have it. I just turned oh, 50 this year, and you think I don't own the stuff my dad handed me over years sure. and years and years? I adore him, but the part of me that genetically is tied to my other family, who I found, uh -huh. um, is very open and very welcoming and we all have different sides and facets to ourselves oh we no do no matter where they come from right absolutely and that's what friend school allows us to accept and know and try to make room the, the thing that's so for. the thing that's so weird to me is why isn't friend school the norm yeah. oh well why is friend school <laughs> way okay the other thing that happened to me very early was uh back in those days i don't know if they still do this but first year teachers uh were packed were sent off to this to up to philadelphia to a haverford college they still do that it's not all at haverford we do require all first year teachers go through a two-year orientation 
And in that, you're required to attend the, um, what it means to be a Quaker in education. You got a lot of slow people. It takes two years. Uh, <laughs> no, we only have so much time. So you get to come to an orientation. Right. And then in the fall and in the spring, you gather for a half day with your cohort which can include the class before or the class after, which uh -huh. ensures some continuity because right. we, we generally turn over between 10 and 20 staff members now. That's how big we are. Yeah, yeah. And by that, I don't mean we're really big. We yeah. have about 100 probably full-time staff members that are receiving benefits. Yeah, and then we have some part-timers, <laughs> some entry level, sure. and some hourly. Right, right. Casual. So, so yeah, it just changes, you know, kind of how we look at orientation. So, Renee? Yeah, well, it, it's a lot different when you're that size. So, back at Harvard, at Haverford, this guy's talking about Quaker education and values and da 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 da. And he's done all this research and he found that the school, all the Quaker schools, which maybe they were like 40 something, I'm, I'm thinking, fall into two camps. Some schools are highly academic. And some schools are highly value oriented. And there's this one dot that fell in the middle. So, you know, you had all the <laughs> academic people over here and all the touchy feely people over there. And there was this one dot in the middle. Yes, us. And he was like, <laughs> I don't get it. And it's like, dude, you mean, what do you mean you don't get it? That's where you should be. Uh, you know, you can't have all touchy feely and don't know what two plus two is. And you can't have only academics and the hell with a human being so i mean the middle is to me seems like the place to be but once you're at a boarding school which you often add when you add the upper school portion to a k-12 through friend school um mm -hmm. then it waits differently for for yeah. these really old institutions they're older than us they came in under a different cultural assumption Oh, yeah. And they're pretty concentrated into one place in our country. You can't, what I have always said when talking to the board or the advancement committee or the general staff when I'm talking about, you know, we ask all the staff to give to the annual fund, so I have to talk about what we raise money for. Sure. Um, I try to make sure that they know we're 55 to 60 years old, depending on whether you take us from 62 or 64 right. or somewhere in between. Right. Um, we're not that old. No. And no. so there's only, I think it's under 20 schools in the country, maybe in the world, but definitely in the country that are pre-K through 12, non-boarding schools, friend schools, mm -hmm. wherever they are. Right. And then you start comparing them, and we're not like any of them. Right. And see, so when I go to the board, they're like, well, we're not other friend schools. And when I go inside, we're not other friend schools. And we are exactly what you're saying, Mark, which is right in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And the middle is not a comfortable place to be. Oh. I not for most places. Oh, yeah, well, for most places. But we're not most places. Now, in the, late, in the late 70s, uh, well, Carolina Friends School was, was, uh, became a presidential scholar award or something like that. I don't know the exact title. And all of us, the teachers thought, oh man, we're on the map. People are going to be knocking our doors down to find out how we do it. Money's going to come flying in. To my knowledge, nobody ever asked a damn question. It was so <laughs> disappointing. And it's like, we're a presidential, you know, whatever that was. Uh, we've been recognized for doing things exceptionally well, and you don't want to know how we did it? Yeah. That was very discouraging. Yeah, we also won an award for uh, energy conservation because we never had the heat on. <laughs> you know, we were all wearing, you know, like five sweaters. And it wasn't air conditioned. Uh, wood to put in the hot, you know, yeah. in the wood stove so that yeah. you could be warm. I mean, there was, there was pride in uh, ecological achievement. Uh, <laughs> And there was you know, pride we, in rebellion. There was pride in setting yourselves apart. Right. And in not, being people that forged a different path that was true yeah, and fair yeah. and socially right. just. And, Wells Edelman. Yeah, Wells. I was just thinking him. Yeah, he yeah, was. 
I mean, what a guy. What a guy. Uh, yep. I mean, he was really something. Well, I remember him. <laughs> I guess I guess the bottom line is is that you can only uh, change what can be changed in your world. You, you, you know, you can't we we can't stand up and get on our soapbox and and change world politics all all that we should. We can we try. <laughs> we can laugh. Yeah, and we can try. We can but try. You have to deal with your your local world and the people you know and who will actually listen to you and you know slowly make a difference. So I think a friend school is sprouting seeds all across the world and people like you Bonnie and Marissa and Rebecca, you young people. Well, <laughs> most of us. Thank you. Not <laughs> anymore, but thank you. Yeah, really. I know. God, geez. Well, that's one thing about the 70s reunion things is yeah. it's funny is like these these well, quite a few years ago these they, all those kids were turning like 40s. And they had teenagers, and they were complaining, raising it. It's like, dude, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. This sounds very, very <laughs> familiar. Yeah, Jill, Jill Redfern would be a perfect example. She was hell on wheels. <laughs> and then when she becomes a parent, it's like, well, you shouldn't do these things, sweet. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. come on. You guys, I want to encourage you to, I can't like broadly share your emails with each other without permission. Uh -huh. You guys can. And you can say, will you tell Jillian to contact us at, yeah. and I can also help facilitate meeting rooms, reunions, small groupings. And by reunion, I don't mean just your class. It can be your class plus two above and two below. Or yeah, see, I, I just want to put out there that I'm here to yeah. kind of do that. And I want to do it. And sure. you should tell me how. Okay. Sure. One of the things, everybody's pissing and moaning about the virus. Okay. Well, yeah. But yeah. look what we're doing. We would not be doing this mm -hmm. if we, if Zoom hadn't come along. I had the largest PSA meeting I have ever been to. I've been a parent for 11 years now. I had 33 people in my Zoom room. What's PSA? That could be more than 33, right? If you have a partner or someone else who's also in there, a fellow parent. Um, it was huge. And Lisa Hess, who many of you may know, um, Lisa, I think is class of 89 and was a lifer at CFS. And Yeah. Um, her uncle also went, I think. I don't know what year. Wow. Was. But he would have been a crab tree. That's how you guys would know that. Exactly. He's a crab tree, crab tree and her, yep. whoever her uncle or cousin was. Yep. Um, crab tree, yep. Oh. Know, she recently was talking about trying to figure out how to get people together and do small groups and try to, you know, mm -hmm. she's a parent mm -hmm. and an alum. So, yeah please feel like you can tell one of us or put it out on Quaker Dome. I will jump on it and try to make it happen. You know, the thing is, is that there's, um, there's so few of us overall mm -hmm. that there's this unique global club of whoever was a CFS graduate because the school is so unique. But then within that, there are obvious differences between my graduating class of 25 people versus 90 and 2000s versus and from the 2000s to the 18. present there's I mean, a vast difference that doesn't mean we shouldn't bring you all together oh no i just think that but, one of the things mark is uh talking about that um uh i thought of as a specific hallmark of the school was total transparency in the way the staff explain what was going on to us. When we moved to DC, I visited Sidwell, uh, which is another well-meaning institute with, yes. with lots of high-powered, you know, presidents, kids. Another and Wilmington Friends School, yes. Where and so you know, And think when I was um, as Sidwell, so yes, but. My, my memory of when I was uh, probably um, 16, uh, maybe, there was a lot of tension with the school had taken a position not to have standardized testing in some format or other. And uh, there were people who were critical of the school academically. So Don uh, had everybody in the upper school meeting room to say, look, you're gonna hear some smack 
talked about the school. Um, and then he said, uh, don't buy into it. These are the same people who tell you that masturbation will make you go blind, pause. And then he said, although you notice I wear glasses. <laughs> and we were all like, what did Don just say? And uh, it remains one of my favorite moments uh, for all those years because it was uh, such so real. But also... I mean, it was one human speaking to another human, even though that other human was plural. It but was we, assuming that you all have the same agency, the same a, a forethought and ability to come to what he said, right? Well, but the idea that you should be, um, you could accept the role. Okay, so uh, Jim used the expression being, being a, a custodian, Mm -hmm. of the land and its um, beauty and history. But also we learned really early that we could accept the opportunity to be an advocate. And yes. being an advocate for the school, you had to be able to be, you know, well spoken in front of older adults and that sort of thing if you wanted to defend, I guess I should say, the school's philosophy. and. You know, we were given the background that if we wanted to do that, we had enough information about why the school's policies existed and what the Quaker philosophy was. You did not have to accept that role. But if you did, you were equipped to do it well. And I can't think of many other schools where um, the students are given that much opportunity to be uh, a representative um, in in a that kind of equal level i mean that was uh i took that very seriously well, for life. meeting eye to eye right and respecting the eyes that you meet yeah. as being equal to yours hence well, we use first names hence yeah, we exactly well, i have yep. a student who to this day if she feels like she wasn't part of the conversation, that there was something placed on her. She'll be like, why do I have to do that? <laughs> she's the smartest teenager I have come across and she's the only teenager I have that challenges. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't matter what it is. She can find her way around the argument. And to me, that's something she gets from feeling confident and being able to argue. Yeah, well, just CFS. It's giving her tools to be. For her, the argument may not be right. Okay. Right. I'll right. Say that loudly. Um, but the ability to do it takes confidence and a sense of self and right. permission, right, and agency. And exactly. for me, that's the most important thing that we have to give our kids. Well, I apologize. I have to say bye yeah. now, but everything you're saying is exactly what I felt. It definitely gave you a sense of advocating for yourself, speaking up for yourself, also trying to come to a consensus with a group, even if you disagreed. That's right. Um, learning how to hear another person, even if you don't feel comfortable with what they're saying. Uh, anytime there was some major event, the teachers did not hide it from us. They brought in lecturers. They discussed everything. You know, we had a great group consensus meetings of all the lower, middle, and upper school there in the multi-purpose room in middle school. Mm -hmm. Just an amazing way of, you know, working with the students as uh, someone who may not understand what they're saying. They may not know that they have the wrong answer, but you're not going to Say, oh, yeah, yeah, I already know that that's wrong. You're going to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> you are the yeah. cutest little girl, Marissa. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you now. It's like, can you see me blushing? <laughs> no. What are, you, what are you talking about? She looks like she's 22. I know. You have oh, not God. seen all. I want you, you to guys look at so John McGovern. Do you all know John McGovern? Yeah. Yes. My Love name. John McGovern. He did this very... beautiful slideshow when he retired. Oh, everything from like fixing the toilets in the lower school when he worked there to, yeah. you know, athletics and the way the campus evolved. Oh, um, yeah. And I'm going to see if maybe that can be part two. 
Yeah. Of this. Yeah, oh, that would be awesome. awesome. That's part of the history. You need to put that up there like Henry's. Well, well it, as much as I, I say it's part two, it's a very different part two, right? John yeah. McGovern doesn't sound like Jim Henderson. It's going to be much more John McGovern. Yeah. And it yeah. has beauty because it is much more John McGovern. Um, right. so exactly. I'm going to ask him if he'd be willing to do it yeah, and, sure. and exactly. all that. And I will share it. And I hope you guys will share it wide. And if mm. there are folks who wish they had had this, if you get them to tell me, We'll do it again. I think Jim is really open to doing it. Again. I, it's great. And it's I can awesome. listen to it every week. Wow, <laughs> this yeah. is wonderful. Marissa, Thank you guys. Marissa, please yes. tell your sister and your parents. Well, um, I have some bad news, sad news about my mom. She wow. has uh, severe Alzheimer's mm. and um, it's really, uh, difficult to talk about. Um, I did talk to Henry because of everything that he went through with his family. My wife, um, her husband, or yeah. her uh, father, and she's a therapist to many with Alzheimer's, and if we can help. Thank you, thank you. So my, my mom's still alive, but you know, you Doesn't know what Alzheimer's is. Yeah. The loss yeah. happens just over a longer period of time. Exactly. And my dad is doing fantastic. He's her primary caretaker and he's right. absolutely amazing. I'm, I, I mean, just, I'm just astounded by the yeah. way he takes care of my mom is just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And my sister is doing fantastic. Yeah. She's in Carrie. She's married with yeah. two children and now two grandkids from her eldest son. Wow. <laughs> Wow. And we have two children, no grandkids yet, better not. <laughs> well, great. Well, you look really happy. Oh, you well, thank you. Me. That's that's amazing. I, I'm stunned that you would say that right now because we're going through some very sad stuff with my father-in-law just passing away from complications from COVID. Not, not that we were anywhere around. He's in Tennessee. Yeah. We're here in North Carolina. No. But he just passed away. So thanks for thinking I that can, I look so happy. <laughs> you do. You actually are glowing and you look oh, thank fabulously you. happy. It's because of you guys. Happy it's because of you guys. Are you kidding me? Look at that smile. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Take Mark, care. Bonnie, I hate this Dan, 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 I hate you up. Uh, yeah. This is, and I just want to say to all of you what an honor it has been to, to be a fly on the wall uh, and what an honor it is to be part of this family. Love you all. Thank you. Bye, Jan. And bye. Right, we'll we'll bye. check in with you all again soon. We are very proud to be part of the Friend School family. Oh, the fact that not only you came, but you brought your mom. Oh, and very popular, <laughs> you know, popular I'm friends. I'm so school. glad that you came. Thank she you. She directed the Great Quillo Middle School production of Spring 74 and various other important stuff. So, please, you can help me a lot, Bonnie. When I plan, I'm an East Coast planner. I'm going to admit it. I suck. I don't always think about what time it is. Oh, don't worry Sometimes about it. Sometimes we perfect. have to do the morning instead of the evening. Please help me plan so that it works for y'all, too. Yeah. This is this fine. Is yeah, super duper. Well, see, Connie wanted to come. Connie Tovarud. She lives in Scandinavia. He's in Norway, and that's a whole other side. But I want to make it so that we can all be part of it, if possible at some point because you and Bonnie and or you and Connie in a room Connie yeah. and Bonnie yeah. that would be pretty sweet well we'll work on it and we're gonna say bye I'm gonna make my mother a pancake dinner you guys have so, a lovely it, breakfast for dinner this was so awesome <laughs> and you'll we'll hear so from me soon and everyone is good I'm so glad keep us posted if at any point you're not let us know if we need to throw out a lifeline yeah, I know from the fire. We're doing okay. I, I saved the Friends School archives when we were evacuated and I brought them back. No doubt. No doubt. I trust yes. you with that. All right. Night, night. Privilege night, night. to meet you. Privilege to meet you all. Bye bye. Bye, guys. Good night, Jan. Bye bye. I just couldn't leave without just telling you how proud I am of you. And 
how proud I am of me because you are so natural in this. So. This kind of thing is so easy and so fun and so a part of who we are. As and as so, well. so important to building and knitting the relationships. So this is the event I was talking about. We're going to see it in other forms, hopefully. But next up is me whining and dining John McGovern to do part two. I have like a five-part series. While you're doing that, Mm -hmm. why don't you take his official copy of the uh, agreement and see if he will sign it? Oh, happy to. Just make sure I'm connected or shared or... Send him an email and I'll copy you on it, okay? Okay. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. And I'm happy to make sure it gets dropped off and he signs off and whoever else he wants. My guess is he'll well, want it's something that I, I have needed. That's picking up a dropped ball for me and I would really appreciate it. But I will either email her or phone him and talk to him first. Oh, yeah. And any chance for me to hang out with John? I love John's curmudgeonly and John's like, you know, a little hard around the edges. And I, I just love the, that. The part. big heart. <laughs> That's the Great part that heart. like works for me. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry, I all day today I couldn't get my camera to work. So please don't worry. I think um Part of what makes us friend school is acknowledging that people may come to our meetings for different reasons in different ways. And whether you were always just a screen that said Jan Zink or sometimes we're present or all the time, it shouldn't be a judgment on how you show up. That's well, part of who we are. I think it's so, easier, it's so much easier if you can see someone's expression. But- not it is, much. but it doesn't have to dictate it. Just like on Facebook, I can have ongoing conversations with Rob's wife, Jen, and barely know her and really feel like I know her. So just okay. know, I think just you showing up matters yeah. a lot. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'll show it up. I'll show up if you do it 10 times. I'll be there every time. Well, tomorrow I'm going to sit down and I've got about half of what I need to get Kim to Kim. So I'm going to do that until noon. And then I think we have a Friday meeting, but I have Maggie at 11 and we're going to finish an import. And I've already found a problem with the last import. So we got to fix that. Um, and I think other than if <laughs> we have a, a school nurse, day. I'm good. It's just a regular day, isn't it, Rebecca? I wish. I wish it were just a regular day. <laughs> I think oh, these, these I also, Jan, just- you're going to see a bunch of stuff come up because I've asked Brian to price stuff for me for alumni care oh. packages. The- so that's like, you know, branded stuff. Uh-huh. And so I am going to try to decide based on the budget I set up um, what I can afford when he writes me back. And then I'm going to ask for your approval and move forward to get it printed and or delivered so we can move on a date for fall alumni care packages. Super. Okay. Super. Awesome. Thank okay. You. I'm going to jump out now. Have it in. Talk to you soon. All right, take care. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.